sweet. Nick Harper, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so we met last fall. I was thinking about it, just out, out and about networking. And ultimately, you ended up being a catalyst for me starting a leadership organization called Sun Leaders. And, you know, that that's something really special. And so, number one, I wanted to thank you for that push. Whether you knew it was happening or not, it happened. And Sun Leaders has been, become like a really cool thing that you frequent, which is awesome. But uh, also, uh, just to like kind of set it up, you're a loan officer at Unifirst Mortgage Lending now? Yes, sir. But you used to be a police officer. I was for six years. Six years. And so, you know, definitely want to dive into all that because, you know, that's one of those industries and careers where it sort of feels like a black box. You know, a normal citizen doesn't really know what goes on as far as being a police officer and what the day to day is like and what tolls that take on your mental health and being out in the world and dealing with a side of society that a lot of us aren't really ever exposed to. And there's just so much there. And personally, I'm fascinated with it. So I was really glad that you were willing to come on and talk to me about it. And so thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And fire away. I'm happy to talk about anything law enforcement. And you're right about the black box thing. It is one of the draws to it, though, is it's so unknown. That's part of why I wanted to get into it. It's like you really don't know what they do. I mean, you see the stuff on TV, like your cop shows, you have your NCIS, your CSIs, law and order, that kind of stuff that kind of gives you a little bit of an insight and a general understanding to the public. But the real day to day and what you actually do is is nothing like those. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. As with a lot of things where you, you think one thing, you know, you like a musician or a sports figure or whatever, and you think, oh, yeah, their day to day is like playing on stage or pl playing the game. But really, there's so much baggage and other things that go along with it or practice or training. And you kind of just alluded to it, but I wanted to first start out with how did you end up becoming a police officer? What drew you to law enforcement? Yeah, so it did start off with the TV, like everyone else. You know, my hero growing up was Jack Bauer from 24. Right. Um, but I also really liked uh, Olivia Benson and Elliot Stabler, Law & Order SVU. Um, those guys kind of were my heroes. And I was like, I really want to be like them. Um, so that drew me into it. And then I think as I aged a little bit more and more, you know, you see it as like, I want to be a hero. I want to be... You know, somebody that so people look up to, or I want to save people, I want to help people. And, uh, that was a huge draw to it as well. And then, again, you get older and you become, you know, a teenage boy or your early 20s and you think you're invincible. And it's like, I just want to drive really fast cars and I want to shoot guns. Like, that's, <laughs> it all comes into these things. And it, there's just so many different poles that lead into it. And then once you get into it, of course, there's a million other things that keep you there. Yeah. Well, what, yeah, I guess I'm kind of interested because it's got to be hard, and, and I want to get into that. But, you know, before that, I guess, you know, if you could just give us a brief overview of, like, what's a normal day like uh, as a police officer? You know, you wake up, and for me, I wake up and I come to the office, and for the most part, the most dangerous part of my day is driving to and from work. It's just the drive, and I could get in a car accident. I But when I'm here... I'm pretty safe. I mean, I'm just kind of interested in all that goes through your mind on the setup of a day, then during the day, and then the unwinding and going back home. And that in particular, like going back home is such a hard thing for most officers because you're trying to leave what everything that just happened at work and it's almost impossible. You see so many different things, you experience so many different things that you know, are horrible. I mean, the reality is you're a cop, you're dealing with negative things, you're not dealing with you know, no one calls the cops because they're having a good day. Like, no right. one calls and says, you know, I ate this great restaurant. You should go check it out. <laughs> it's because there's a problem. Something's wrong. And if it's something they can handle, they're not going to call you. So you're going for, you know, extreme acts of violence, things against children, um, suicides, murders. I mean, death. I mean, these things are all very real. And they happen a lot more than people think, um, especially just people dying in their home, like elderly folks. And so you end up going on a lot of deaths, unattended deaths. And that that's hard to leave there when you go home. But to answer the question of like a typical day, there isn't one. <laughs> like, I guess to be the best answer to yeah. that. Um, you hear a lot on like the news and stuff. They say it was like a routine call, and that doesn't exist. Um, you might say it was 
nothing maybe abnormal on it once it's done. But going up to it, there's every call comes in differently. You don't know the address. You might not know who's involved. You don't know the circumstances behind what you're actually responding to. And so generally you get as much information as you can from dispatch. Maybe if they're still on the phone with them on the way, you're like, hey, can you ask them this? Like, where's the gun? How many people are there? You know, whatever information you feel is pertinent sure. that you need to know at that point, try to get that on the way. But when you walk up to it, everything that dispatch told you could be completely wrong. <laughs> and that happens frequently. Oh. Like somebody like in a public park, are like, oh, I just saw this guy assault this other guy. And they might call that in. But then you show up and it's like, no, they were brothers. They were just wrestling and goofing around. Like, but if you just go strictly off of that, you might roll up, you know, guns out or something along those lines. So you really have to take everything in step as you're pulling in and as you're getting out. Like it's a constant process of information. Depending on your agency and how many people you have your day could be doing some traffic stops, um, state patrols, things like that do a lot more of that because their main duty is traffic. So they do a lot more traffic crashes and things along those lines. I was a municipal officer. And so we dealt with, you know, municipal code violations, uh, state crime, and there was some federal stuff in there, but most of the time it gets turned over to those agencies. And that was out in Colorado. In Colorado. Yep. I worked for Palisade Police Department and Glenwood Springs Police Department. And so you respond to, like I said, your domestic violences, assaults, thefts, a lot of thefts uh, from businesses. The more businesses you have, the more thefts you're going to get. If you have a Walmart or a Target or one of those big box stores, you're going to be there pretty frequently. So you get to know their loss prevention staff. You get to learn where their cameras are and how they work. And you sometimes you know how to pull video better than the employees do because you're in there so many times. Wow. But you might respond to a bunch of different things and... Once you're done out having your calls and your fun, you got to come back and there's, of course, a stack of paperwork you got to do. Everything's thoroughly documented. Everything requires certain legal language. So that way, when you end up in court, the right words are in the report that you have. Body cameras, you have to review footage from time to time. If like, hey, I need to look at what this person say exactly and you want to quote them or whatever it may be. So it takes so much longer on the back end than just... I drive up, I deal with the problem, and that's it. And you have to do your charging documents, and you have to do just a bunch of different things on the back end. Wow. And so that's interesting. Not after the incident you do the paperwork. It's at the end of the day before you check out. So you go back to the station, then you process all the paperwork for those things? Or does it depend? It depends on your day. I mean, if you have time in the middle of the day, and you had some stuff that morning, and maybe there's a lull in the middle of the day, it's a work day or one's at work, not a lot's happening and you can go in and knock out your paper, you do that. So at the end of the day, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Most of the time it's done at the end though, just because shift change happens. So the next shift is coming in. There's a little bit of an overlap so that the guys on the street can get off and the guys coming in can get back on. And when you get off, you can go do everything and not necessarily worry about another call coming out, but it, it's inevitable. You'll get started, you'll get right into the groove of it. And then something major comes out, it's all hands and you're flying back out. And sure. Next thing you know, it's been an 18 hour day and you're on your 19th cup of coffee losing your mind. <laughs> How long are normal days? Different agencies have different things. Usually 12 is the max. Um, some guys will run 12-hour shifts. Some do 10s. There's some that do like a mixture. They'll do like 11 and then a 10 one day and 11 a different day. It, gotcha. Just however they need to spread the coverage out to make sure the road's covered. Yeah. It's wild because, you know, you said, you know, a, a traffic stop putting myself in that position, and I've thought about this well before, like years ago, where I just put myself in a police officer's shoes one day, and I was like, even rolling up to like someone who is speeding, when they roll down the window, like, I don't know what state they're in or what they're going to do. I'm just fascinated and impressed and thankful that there are people like you who are brave enough and and gutsy enough and there's so many words for it to put yourself out there in such a vulnerable way. Obviously, you've got a gun, a vest, you're you're in a a powerful position, you've got a car that's a little um souped up, if you will, but overall, you are so vulnerable to whatever could happen. Anything could happen and everything kind of does play out and I'm just I'm just wondering, like, I, I guess maybe it probably is covered in training, though. Is there is there practice on mentality where like, how do you get courage? And, and I'm sure traffic stop is much easier. But even with that, but like, OK, we just got a call. 
and it, there are literally people pulling out guns and we're going into like an active, serious situation. What's like the training to get into a mindset or to stay calm? Can you walk me through that? I mean, we do so much different training on trying to like simulate that as much as you can because that's the best way to remain calm is it's familiar to you. So like, yeah, we do active shooter drills. We went into like a middle school and we had like simulation guns that shoot soap rounds. So they actually shoot rounds like a normal gun, but it's just soap. Like a paintball gun. Kind of, yeah. right. And so we're going through the school doing active shooter drills with these soap guns, but it's real. They have actors, kids that are running down the hall screaming at you. They put paint on them. Um, they have kids lie in the hallway. So like you're oh stepping over bodies. I mean, it's all mock. No, nobody's actually hurt. Still. And then, but you're seeing it and it's real. And one of the times we did it, they put on like heavy metal music in the cafeteria and they had like different lights going on and off. Like they're just trying to throw everything they possibly can at you. So when you get on scene and you're going through one of these things, you're like, well, at least the metal music's not going, you know, like, all right, yeah. there's the kids. I've seen that. And you kind of just keep going and you rely back on your training. Like, all right, what's the first thing I got to do? Find the shooter. You're focusing on the steps and the priorities you need to do. And that's the best way to stay focused. If you're sitting there worried about like, oh, the gravity of this, like, there's dead kids. This is going to be on the news. And oh my gosh, that kid's hurt. And like that, that's traumatic. And if you get caught up in that in the moment, you're dead. I mean, yeah. that's the reality. If the shooter's looking for you, they're going to win. And you're trying to win. You're trying to win that situation. You're trying to help people. But if you live in the moment, as opposed to just focusing on what needs to happen, you're going to get lost in that. And like on traffic stops, those are generally referred to as like some of the most dangerous calls and things that you do. Because you don't know anything. There's no background information from dispatch. You don't know who you're stopping. You don't know what their intent is. Right. You don't know what their mindset is. I mean, you have no information. You have no idea who it is. <laughs> I mean, not even like who called 911. Usually you get information as who's calling and can go from there. And so you have to be on edge a lot for those. And you try to do it with a backup officer if you can get one. You try to do it in lighted places. You try to control as many different things with that stop as you can. So it'll eliminate a lot of those factors. And on top of that, you have traffic going by you. You have, you know, people that are looky-looing you and causing other issues at the same time. And people, we've had people run up to us on traffic stops reporting other crimes. And it's like, I'm in the middle of dealing with this. I can't. Oh my gosh. Like, this is not the appropriate way to report a crime, but they're having that emergency and they see you and that's all they're thinking. They're not thinking, I need to call 911. And so you have to be able to remain calm under so many unpredictable things and there's never anything that's the same it takes a lot of practice it takes a lot of getting used to it i think like when i first started um here's a funny story for you um i was 23 years old when i first got into law enforcement when i first got my job you know nothing at 23 like <laughs> you just don't you don't have the life experience no matter what it is to know society right and I go on this call. It's a noise complaint at a hotel. For an average cop, that's nothing. It's like, tell them to turn it down. You move on with your night, grab an ID, whatever. And so I'm going out with my trainer, and my backup officer happens to be a guy from my academy that I grew up with. We were friends. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going on a call with my friend. Like, this is going to be a good time. Like, I'm kind of like bubbled up a little bit, ready to go. And get up to the door, and he's like, all right, you're just going to knock, get their ID, talk to them that they need to turn it down, and we're all going to get out of here, okay? And I was like, got it you know like i'm ready to go and so i knock on the door the guy answers and like i almost panicked because i was like now i have to be the authority the dude who answered the door is like 45 years old and i'm going to be the one telling him what to do uh -huh. and so for some reason i said you guys are causing a ruckus up here i have never said the word ruckus <laughs> once in my life not since not before that but that's just what came out and as soon as i said it my Friends running down the hall laughing. The training officer turns around laughing. <laughs> and the guy who answered the door, of course, sees all that and he starts laughing. So now I'm like embarrassed <laughs> on top of trying to focus on what I'm doing. Obviously, it wasn't a serious call, but you go through those things and eventually it's like, well, now next time I go on the noise complaint, I'm not going to say ruckus. So like, yeah. you're going to be more, you're just more confident. And sure. so the more and more you go through it, the more calls you go on, the easier it gets, the easier it's to maintain your focus and just be objective. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm, com I'm trying my best to compare my life experiences with certain mindsets that you're, you're speaking about. One thing that comes to mind is, you know, playing on stage as a musician on drums, you know, at first, like my first handful of shows, my goodness, I'm just paranoid, nervous, scared, 
you know, what if I screw up, you know? And then, you know, as time went on, you know, played at the Hard Rock or Ruth Eckerd or the Floridian, and those were the easier shows. Honestly, it's the smaller venues that somehow get into your head a little more because it's more intimate and people, you feel like people can hear the mistakes more. But it was all mindset on staying calm, especially as a drummer. There's something about having to stay loose as well as being tight at the same time. Because if you get too tight, you're too rigid and you're not going to flow well, you know, and it was, it was all a mindset thing. And I really quickly wanted to capitalize on that because I'm, I'm thinking about you and now in your current role in, in mortgage lending, you're a loan officer. Um, it's funny that that's like officer oh, still. Sir, sir. <laughs> I just, I literally, just, when that came out of my mouth, I just put that together. But I'm wondering how your training as a police officer has affected your day-to-day -day in, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial journey. Because, you know, as a business owner, there's a lot of ups and downs and different stuff that we deal with through the day. Nothing like a police officer. But has that affected the way that you carry out business? Well, law enforcement to start gave me a great ability to work with people because you have to communicate with literally everybody from every background you can imagine in some of the most complicated situations or confusing situations or intense situations. And then you go into the business side. It's like even on your worst conversation, it's like, OK, maybe they're mad at you and some deal went wrong. Like it's not life or death. It's not somebody who wants to harm you physically. It's just a conversation. So like at the end of the day, the stress level is drastically lower, but it gives you the ability to communicate. It gives you good problem solving skills. Like if there's an issue on your deal, you were able to go through that Rolodex in your mind pretty quick and figure it out just because on the street, that's, that's your resource. I mean, you have to think quick. And so it kind of translates that way. Um, but also just no problem in business has ever been, I guess you view it seriously because it is a serious thing. But it's just at the end of the day, you're like, it's a deal. It's a transaction. It's a conversation. It's not a, a serious thing where someone could die or go to jail. And so that there's a huge difference there. Oh, sure. Uh, but the skill set and the communication and working with people definitely translates. Yeah, that all carries over. Thinking about my first job, I worked at a car wash. And I was like a salesperson. And then I, I cleaned the car wash, cleaned the cars. I did everything. But like right away, starting to talk to people and like, upselling them on hey you know your rims are really dirty you want to just add tire shine for two dollars and they're like sure you know that there's like skill there that translates to today makes a lot of sense uh what you're saying about you know how you compose yourself now especially speaking to people i mean and speaking to people in all sorts of situations i i even run into clients or you know people who are kind of hot and they're having a bad day. Someone was just having a bad day the other day. And, you know, I was like, whoa, you're like really hot right now. And it's nothing like <laughs> life or death situation, but I felt like I was able to talk them down. But that would be extremely valuable. No matter what you do in life, You, I feel like you're so prepared in so many ways. It's just learning the trade or the tool, but your mindset, your composure, you're set on that. It opened your eyes to how the world works, for sure. Like, I don't want to say by any means I was sheltered because I definitely had an interesting childhood, but you you learn how to, I guess, appreciate the way society operates. You learn about government. You learn about the functions of business. You have to, because you have to be able to investigate, like, financial crimes. You have to know um, about business operations to say, okay, this employee committed a crime because they did X, Y, or Z, or um, you have to learn about how government works. I mean, you need to watch out for... Like it always comes back to financial when you get into these things, but like they're funneling money or they're forging documents or all these kinds of things. You have to know at what level and what role these people can play to really interact with that. And in law enforcement in particular, it's entirely governed by government. I mean, right. it is a government entity. You are a government bureaucrat on the street. As a member of law enforcement, you are enforcing the government's laws. And so town meetings state meetings, the legislature, the federal legislature, I mean, all these different things matter and you have to know what's going on with them. And so when you go into the private sector and you're going into business, for me, when I'm a loan officer, right, I have to follow the markets. I have to watch, you know, the stocks are going up and down. I have to watch the prices of mortgage-backed securities. I need to know when's a good time to lock, when's not a good time to lock. Are rates coming down? Are rates going up? And 
you talk to any realtor, you talk to your clients, first thing they're going to ask you is what are rates today? Where are they at? Like, that's just the conversation. What's going to happen next? Tell me if you know anything about the stock market, what's going to happen next? Because, uh-huh. I mean, we all know generally it goes up over time, but it could crash at any moment. We could have a bad thing happen at any moment. And the same happens with rates. And so you have to kind of follow the news as well because anything can affect that. Like when Russia and Ukraine happened, that was a bad day for markets. Sure. <laughs> like that affected <laughs> it's a bad day things. in general. <laughs> the worst day we've had, oddly enough, in mortgage backed security pricing in the last 30 years was Brexit. Of all the things really? to impact mortgage backed security prices, that was the single worst day. I don't know why in particular that connection happens. But if you look at the graphs, it is the day Brexit was announced. We took a nosedive in mortgage-backed security prices. And now we're dealing with the effects of COVID and yeah. how the government responded to that and the checks and all those kinds of things. We had a problem. We had to find a solution as a government response to it. But there's consequences. And there's consequences for everything we do. Uh, it just so happens that right now the housing market is is feeling the brunt of that. Yeah, yeah. And the housing market is so intertwined with what happens because everybody for the most part needs a home and uh you have to get mortgage most of the time to get a home and i mean there's just so much contingent on that oh man where to unpack i was gonna say you know for me i'm i've been eventually here soon we're gonna outgrow our house and it's like hey well, let me know when those uh those rates are gonna go down right. <laughs> but i know it's a dumb question i mean so we look at articles and we have so many different, you know, analysts saying this is going to happen. This is going to happen. I mean, if you follow like National Association of Realtors, they have their economists. And then there's, you know, CNBC has their own economists. Everybody has a different opinion and they're all different. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I interpret this data to mean this. I interpret this data to mean this. Or they focus on different data points. Sometimes there's just so much information that you can't come to a conclusion on the same level. But you kind of just have to go with your gut and experience and the time in. You know, I'm fortunate enough to have a team member um, that's been doing this closing in on 40 years. Wow. Like, there's nothing he hasn't seen or dealt with at this point in this business. He is saying, like, right now it's a little bit unusual than things he's ever seen before just because of that COVID implement. I mean, we've never seen a shutdown like that before. Right. And I was in law enforcement when that happened. Oh, yeah. were you? <laughs> I was in law enforcement. And, like, right after they and, announced, um... like, government shutdowns, the next day I'm on a traffic stop with my sergeant and we're like, what's the policy on this? Do we need to wear masks now? Cause we're out in public and like the jail had jail standards. Like they were like, if people are sick, do not bring them here. Like we can't have the whole jail population getting sick. It was just like, oh my God, it English. expands so far reaching all these problems. And so we're sitting there on this traffic stop calling supervisors and chiefs and jail sergeants like, Hey, we have somebody with a warrant. What what's the policy right now? Like, what do we do? Wow. And uh, the strangest thing is, like, we weren't even worried about necessarily the person with the warrant. It was just like, what's the proper policy and procedure? <laughs> sure. Yeah, you don't want to do the wrong thing. I mean, it's a big deal. Exactly. Like, following the rules <laughs> when you're the one laying down the rules or enforcing them, I should and say. Exactly. And it was another odd thing. You'd have people calling in, like, complaints. People aren't following COVID protocols. And it's like, that's not, I'm not going to enforce that. Like, I don't. It puts you in such a weird position because there wasn't really a statute on it, but there's like CDC policies that have been ash- like issued and social distancing was a thing. And what is your role in doing all those things? Like it, it was just so interesting to watch that from the ground level. Oh man, I can't imagine. I also imagine the shifts in like traffic stops certainly went down. I bet you could watch the graph plummet on that. But domestic abuse, I bet, went up. Everybody's super tense, stuck at home. Exactly. A um, lot of people were at home. Yeah. I, I just, it's, it was a wild time. But yeah, you were like right there in the front of it. You know, I would imagine it was just uh, difficult to navigate when, I mean, everyone was like, what do I do? When do I stop wearing a mask? When do I need to wear a mask? And all this. And, and you're trying to enforce rules that you don't even know exactly what the real rule is. It's a wild and time. And I'm kind of balancing between careers here, but like you said, you had everybody staying at home. So divorce rates changed, right? Like a bunch more people got divorced because they just couldn't handle being around each other that much. Wow. How does that relate to the housing market? Well, now you got people that need to 
go out and buy homes. Uh, now you have uh, people needing to take cash out to pay off debt or pay off their partner so that they can leave and go buy their home. Or you're having a lot more divorce settlements affecting people's home affordability. And that creates a whole bunch of stress on those people. And now you're back into law enforcement because people are like, how am I going to make up this difference in money? I'm going to go, you know, steal something or I'm going to go, you know, steal money from my employer. Or I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make that happen. And so it, everything's intertwined. <laughs> That's definitely oh, yeah. what I've learned from these two professions is you really see that the littlest thing in society has such far reaching aspects and it's so hard to legislate these issues away and it's so hard to take real meaningful action in a lot of these cases yeah i mean that's such a good point i mean you know they we all share the same air my actions affect your actions my actions in this room affect people listening in a different state in some way or another there's ripples across all this um it's interesting that the two different lenses that you've seen it through ah man it's just fun peeling back the onion with you i mean even doing that <laughs> taking that even a step further like with law enforcement it's viewed as a collective nobody knows the difference between cops you have a uniform you're a cop that's generally the public reaction they can't separate you from a state trooper a county deputy Uh you know if you're in that uniform that's just you're a cop that's be, be all end all and these different departments and have different responsibilities they view things differently like i promise you state patrol knows more about doing a check on a like a commercial motor vehicle than I ever could because they do it all the time they right. run like the way stations and all that kind of thing but if you go on like a shooting call or you go on an assault in progress I'm going to be way better than them because they just don't respond to that now if they're in the area and that call comes out they're like hey I'll come back you up but they don't have the same mentality they don't have the same experience they don't take the same steps that we would the same way I wouldn't on inspection of a big rig i just i don't know how to do it because i don't do it right yeah geez yeah but you're right everybody you know hey you're in uniform boom that's 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 who you are and that's why like somebody law enforcement messes up in florida it affects you in colorado somebody messes up you know in a different country even sometimes that it comes back to you and yeah you are all doing the same job technically i mean you're all enforcing laws you're all generally doing the same thing but it's such a diverse and large profession and there's so many different theories and methods on controlling crime and preventing crime and policies and procedures for the expectation of officers to do that Um, some are better than others some departments are newer than others Um, some have old entrenched problems i mean frankly within them sure you know some of them have a lot of biases and things that are we want taken out of that profession obviously because they're negative to society and negative to people but if somebody from you know atlanta georgia had a bad experience there and they come to you know palisade colorado they're going to assume i'm going to do the same thing they don't know the difference even though we police totally different the mentality of law enforcement is totally different between those states and so you have to take into account okay, they may not know how we do things here. They may not know my approach. And it's like, okay, you've had a bad experience. Like, you kind of have to talk them off the edge. Like, I'm different. You don't know me. And let's walk through this together. And you really have to try to calm people down sometimes and account for things you had nothing to do with. Yeah, right. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, and the reputation of, you know, law enforcement is just so vast. You know, you you get some people who just despise police officers because they had a bad experience or, the, you know, they, they threw my brother in jail or whatever. And then literally the opposite where a police officer saved my life. I love police. Right. Everything in between, too. Exactly. It's It's wild. I can't not ask this question. And maybe like reason why people play this, although this has been absolutely fascinating already. But I got to ask, what's the wildest story? What's the craziest call that you ever got? Craziest situation that you were ever put in? And maybe it's hard to pinpoint one if you got two, but what I've got stands two. Out? I've got two. I've got a hundred, but yeah. <laughs> two that come to mind instantly. One, so Palisade was a really small department. And so I was the only officer on. It's the middle of the night. Really? Only officer on? Only officer on duty in Palisade. It's a 1.1 mile jurisdiction. Um, that so sounds my... scary. <laughs> and in of itself, it can be. You get used to it, oddly enough. But your backup's the county. So if you need help, the county's coming at you. They're probably five, six miles away. Okay. There's a Beck. That's not far either. But 
Um, so I'm the only one on out there and there's what's called license plate readers or LPRs that are on the interstates. And so they can track cars and they know where people are going and things like that. And one of the cars that drove through hit a license plate reader, had a hit on it because it was entered in the database as some a vehicle law enforcement was looking for. And so dispatch airs it, hey, this car is coming towards Palisade. It's going to be out there, you know, in a few minutes or whatever. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm kind of close. I'll go see if I can find it. Get on to first street. And sure enough, the car passes me. I'm like, oh, I got it. <laughs> like, What are we looking for this car for? And so like, I'm trying to figure out who this even is and what the reason we're going after them is. Dispatch like, well, they've been breaking into houses. Um, they stole the car. Um, out of this person's house they broke in the house stole a bunch of stuff took their car when they left and the car was the garage door opener so they came back later opened the garage door went and took more stuff including firearms and things out of these people's house and so like it's an insane call but now we have information he may be armed because he stole firearms this person's willing to do some crazy stuff if they're willing to go back to a house they already burglarized stole their car and do it again and so i'm like all right probably not mentally stable but like you're following them and i wasn't going to engage until waiting for county like hurry up county let's get here and he pulls into a parking lot goes to the far end and stops and just parks and i'm like okay did you have your lights on at this time i did once he parked i didn't have a choice i felt like that was kind of my discretion at that point but i turned them on once i was there because i'm like well if I just sit here with lights on him, I don't want him to think I'm just some random person. Might as well identify myself. Yeah. And so I did. And I'm like kind of taking position of cover behind my car. I'm like, where's where's my backup set? Like, this is what's going on. This is where we are. And eventually he like really slowly backs out and starts driving towards me. But he's going like five miles an hour. Like he is creeping along through this parking lot. And I'm so confused because I'm like, I don't know what this dude's intention is. Like, if he's trying to get away, wouldn't you either run or, like, floor it or, what? like, what's happening? And so, like, he's creeping right by my car. And, he like, I'm going around it as he's coming the other way. And he just kind of creeps right by me, pulls out, and gets on the road. And as soon as he gets on the road, of course, now county shows up. So we start the fun part where we get into the chase and we're going and the deputies are now like flying into Palisade. I've got like five or six, you know, all in there. And so we're like a mob of cops going after this car. And it was their hit. The county had actually entered it. So they were like, we're going to take lead on this chase. I'm like, please do. (laughs) You guys got this, right? And so now I'm just in the position, sitting behind them, watching them like, hey, we're going to ram this thing. Are we good? They're like, yes. They start ramming it. They hit it like four or five times before they spun it out in front of the high school into a fence. And like, I don't know how this cop got out of his car fast enough, but he jumped out and was on that hood of that car like half a second. Like it was insane. He was just had this dude at gunpoint and I get out and I'm walking down and the sergeant just hands me like it looked like a giant piece of military equipment it was a 40 millimeter uh launcher that had sponge rounds in it so like if you shot somebody with it it'll disable them but it can't kill them like a less lethal oh, munition huh and he goes Jeez. bj gets out shoot him with this and he just hands it to me God. Oh, okay <laughs> it was just an experience but eventually they got him out of there and so that one was pretty fun <laughs> another one had a shooting in progress and this one was pretty interesting because happened to be a night we had a lot of people on I had a trainee with me, um, my sergeant was on, had a trainee with him, and then we had another officer that had just gotten out of training that I had just finished training. And so the shooting comes out, and I'm with my trainee. My focus is more on training them necessarily on versus what the call is, but you're kind of doing both at the same time. And I'm like, all right, you know where we're going? Like, this is serious. You got to know where we're going. He goes, yeah, I know where we're going. Start going. I'm listening to the radio, trying to get all the updates. Sergeant's saying, hey, what's the plan? Where are you going? I'm like, we're going to respond in. You go after the car, because this shooter had left in a car. And uh, we roll up to the street. And of course, my trainee drives right past it. I'm like, stop. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> That's the street. And so he's turning around, trying to get back there. The other officer gets there that had just gotten out of training. He ended up being the first on scene. He beat us. And as soon as he gets on the radio, he is like shrieking. Like he is panicking. Almost like you can just hear his voice cracking. It's really high pitched. And this dude is ex-military. This dude had been, he's seen some stuff. Like he knew what he was doing, but it was just, it's a different world when you're at home and you're seeing like regular apartment buildings around you instead of, you know, desert in a foreign country. It's just a different mentality. Yeah. And so he's shrieking. I'm like, all right, now we got to go deal with him and get him safe. And I've got the guy in the car next to me. I'm like, I got to take care of him and make sure he's learning while responding to this guy who just got shot. And so we get out of the car, the guy that 
first got there, I was like running towards the building, I'm like, stop, 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 you know, come back. So get him under control. And then we go up the stairs, we're in a stack and get up to the second level of this apartment building. And I'm looking and I can see the guy lying half in, half out of the apartment building. He's alive. He ended up getting shot in the butt cheek. Ow. <laughs> and so his pants are around his ankles. And he's just like half in, half out of this room. Oh. And me being like the immature child I am, is kind of like giggling on the inside. I'm like, oh my God, this just got so ridiculous. <laughs> like, <laughs> But it's a super intense situation and like guns are out and, um, like I'm talking to dispatch and communicating with my team what we're going to do. And eventually we cleared and everything ended up okay. We eventually got the guy that did it. The guy that got hit was okay. Yeah. But it was just such a surreal experience with so many different things going on. And you're still trying to accomplish what you're doing, but you're also you. And like in that moment, like I care about these dudes. Like I just got done training this guy. And when you're training in law enforcement, they're with you the entire shift. Like you get there, you're together, you're in the car together, you're doing paperwork together, you leave together, like, all day long, and you're doing this for weeks on end, so like, four or five weeks at a time with a trainer, and so you get to know them, like, you have time to talk, it's like, I care about this person, I want them to be okay, and, like, when that came out, and you heard him in that state, you're like, okay, well, what's going on with them, I know him, he had an issue with this, or whatever, and you're running through so many different things in such rapid succession, and you're trying to be like, okay, but this is also a shooting. I've got my sergeant in my ear, like, hey, what was the car? What direction did they go? I've got the trainee. I'm like, hey, man, you need to do this. Like, this is what we're doing. Like, trying to explain on the fly. And you're trying to balance all these different things. It's, But in the moment, it seemed so easy. Like, that's what's the craziest part. It's like, I had been on enough intense things. Like, the intensity of the moment was nothing. Like, it didn't bother me. It was the res- more the responsibility of my teammates. That's what was getting to me. Sure. And so the call itself was fine. It was smooth. We took care of everything. We eventually caught up with the guy later. But it was just so surreal in that moment to like be like, this is actually happening. But it, it was entertaining. And I think that's the messed up part. Like you had brought up the kind of person that a cop has to be and like the mentality that goes along with that. I think in order to be a cop at all, there has to be a little bit of a screw loose somewhere that you're willing to do that. (laughs) Yeah. And the people that aren't cut out for it find out pretty quick. I mean, they'll wash out in training. Just, it's just not for me. Yeah. And that's fine. And I'd rather them wash out then than four or five years down the line when we need them to be on their game and they just aren't up to it. Sure. But yeah, that that little bit of a screw loose, I think came in that moment. So I'm like, this is super serious and it's, but it, I'm having a lot of fun. Like, is it, like <laughs> there is no job you will ever do that gives you an adrenaline rush like that. Like oh, on no. either of those calls, it's just not possible. No. And so now I'm like, oh, it's an exciting day at work. I've I'm doing a podcast with my friend Josh. You know what I mean? It's like that's the excitement for my line of work now. <laughs> like that's a good day. Well, at least you're safe. You're <laughs> right. safe here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Autumn Pilar and I'm the Editor-in-Chief for the Lakewood High School's news website. And on behalf of our class, I thank Josh Naiman for coming in and teaching us the importance of learning and creating in the world of podcasts and teaching us about him as well. Thank you. Wild, man. Wild. I mean, I know we've talked and you told me some other stories and and such. Um, I figure maybe I'd switch gears a little and, and get maybe a different side of the coin because I do want to shed light on, you know, different aspects of law enforcement where, you know, like you hear you know, firefighters are in such a different light. You know, they saved a cat out of the tree or they saved this woman from a burning building. I was kind of wondering what's a story that sticks out that's like, felt really good that you like a heart warmer that it's like man I felt really good about that we helped and nothing you know nobody was hurt maybe or maybe they were hurt but you helped I, I'm just kind of curious on if anything stands out I mean the most heartwarming one I think we ever had um, again the LPR the license plate reader hit on a car it was actually out of Tennessee for a kidnapping oh and gosh so I was actually in training at the time but I was driving, had the car. I'm like, well, it's coming our way. Let's go. So we get up there. Get them. And see the car. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So we get it. And all we know is that there's a kidnapped kid that's under the age of three. 
and they're supposed to be in this car with this man that took her. Ultimately, I think it was the father, but he had lost the rights to the kid and didn't like that, so took the kid. Mm. But we pull it over, and we're walking up to the car and approaching, because traffic's on the driver's side, so I'm coming around on the passenger side and look in the pass- rear passenger window, and she's sitting there. Like, the baby is sitting in her car seat in the back seat of this car. And so we were fortunate, I think, on that one. He didn't want to fight or run, but we had to get him out of the car, one, because if he runs, it puts you in such a hard spot as a cop because now you know there's a kid. Like, you know they are in the car. Oh, okay. And so now do you chase... Because if you chase and they crash, you're going to hurt the kid. Do you let them go and risk them hurting the kid? What strategy do you deploy at that point to limit their ability to run while also taking care of the kid? Like it, It's such a hard balance to put in. Is there a protocol if, if he did run? Or is it a we're gauging it's You gauge it case. as you go is the best way to put it, but... Like so many agencies now don't do chase. Like they don't have a chase policy. The, With a kid in the car at all. Yeah. So you like, let them go. Some yeah. And most municipalities now it's no chase. They will not chase you. And the reason is it's such high liability that if I'm making, the way the courts have interpreted it is I'm making you speed to get away. Uh... And so if I let you go, that kind of stops it. However, there's exceptions to every rule, like there always is. I mean, if it's this person's wanted for homicide, okay, well, we're going to keep going. Like, that's just the way it is. You know, policies are you don't shoot from a moving vehicle. There's plenty of stories. Ask any veteran cop that's been around for a long time of guys are shooting through their windshield because they had the shot and they had the opportunity to do it while in motion. You're responsible for every single one of those. Like if, if you miss and hit somebody or something oh, that you, you own that shot, but you, in the moment you just do what you have to do and hopefully you end up on the right side of it. And you try to follow your training and the policies and procedures. I mean, they are there for a reason most of the time because somebody shot through their windshield and missed, right? And that's why they tell you don't do that. But going back to that particular situation, we just got lucky because we are like, hey, man, get out of the car. We need to talk to you about this. And like, we just wanted him out because traffic was going by really loud. We didn't want to let him know we knew there was a problem. Like, oh, traffic's really loud. I can't hear you. Can you get out and talk to me over here? And as soon as he was out, we took the keys. And I was like, we got, like, we got the kid. We got him out. If he wants to run now, at least we have the kid. Like, yeah. And so we just got her safe, got her with DHS, and it made the news, and they brought, like, her family back, came and picked her up, and got a letter from, you know, the FBI who put it out because it was interstate. Like, that was a commendation. That felt amazing, like, having that come in. That was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. That's a huge deal. I mean, you're in a ways. Maybe save that little girl's life. I mean, anything with a kid. I have a 17-month-old. And, uh, I mean, I'm just getting worked up even thinking if something happened to her. So, I, I mean, this just that changes the game. Or when you were talking about school shootings and stuff like that, I mean, it breaks my heart. Like, how is this shit happening? But, man, like, having to respond to that stuff, that's, I just can't imagine it. And responding to, and, like, Nick is, like, I guess Nick is a cop and Nick as myself kind of have to approach it differently because when you're in the role of a cop it's mechanical it's i have to do x y and z my role is this i can't think i can't get emotional it's find them and take care of it do it safely yeah and a lot of the times like especially with the shooting in texas where the cops sat outside I, that may, that one makes me extremely angry especially because every training i've ever been to is go like yeah. i don't care what's going on you just go i've never once been trained you sit outside and wait especially not for hour or whatever. Like, Yeah, what was up with that? I, what the I hell? don't know. And it's extremely frustrating, and there's no defense for it. And things like that are why people hate cops. And, like, especially as on the civilian side of it now, like, I can see it. I'm like, there's a million reasons why people hate cops, and a lot of them are justified. Like, cops mess up a lot, but the downside is, like, it's such a public profession. Yeah. Like, everything you do is in public view. Now, body can sort of thing, so everything's on video. Every mistake you make is going to be ridiculed and criticized. And a lot of the times they're wrong. Like yeah. you just, you are wrong. I'm and sorry. You're a human. That's the difficult thing too, is you could have all the training in the world, but you're a human and sorting through every scenario. And I mean, you have to choose one choice. You know, you have 20 choices in front of you. There's one path that you're going to go, whether it's wait 
or go. It's I, And everyone will do it differently. I mean, the guys that have been doing it for, you know, 15, 20 years have such a diverse set of tools that they can use to do this. They like, okay, I had this experience. I can rely on that. And they go with that. A newer officer, a year, two years, three years in, maybe hasn't seen anything like this before. And so they're going off of limited information, kind of making it up on the fly. And they're going into a super serious situation. And the media, like, I don't want to harp on media, but like in particular, what makes the news is when cops do something bad or something bad happens because that's what's interesting. That's what's going to sell. No one, like that news story, like I said, that story where we got the kid made the news. The only reason that made the news was because it was an interstate kidnapping case from the FBI. Right. Like we've arrested people for fighting and stopped domestic violence cases. Those don't make the news because nobody cares. Like you stopped a wife beater. That's not newsworthy. Like it, but you saved the wife. You're like that's extremely important to her. Like you did your job, you did a good deed, but that's not interesting. So like the good deeds, a lot of the time that law enforcement does just simply aren't newsworthy. Yeah. And that's sort of the frustrating part is it's a very negative profession in what you're dealing with, the way you're perceived and the way the media has to portray it. And I understand why it's that way, but it is it is pretty frustrating. Yeah, that is unfortunate. It's a, it's unfortunate in so many different realms, not just, you know, policing, but, you know, and I guess a lot of it comes down to law enforcement. But, you know, what's happening all over the world, you know, it's like, let's let's like even it out continually. All right. You have a, a story that's negative. Well, uh, look at this scientific achievement, you know, or whatever. Let's balance it out because there's plenty of good stuff happening. And there's plenty of good cops and good people doing great things throughout the day. It's yeah, it's like why why people slow down when they see a car crash or whatever. People are drawn to that. And obviously these private companies who are news sources, that their objective is to get more eyeballs. And that's the thing that drives eyeballs. And I think one of the most funny things that happened when I got into law enforcement, like I always wanted to know what was happening. You go by a crash, like, what's going on? What's happening? Like, are they okay or whatever? And, you see cops running with lights and sirens on. You're like, oh, when are they going to? It must be really exciting. Like 99% of the time, it's boring. It's pointless. Like somebody will roll their car and they're fine. It was just an icy road and they got out with minimal injuries. It just looks really bad because they their car rolled over. Or they're like going to a medical emergency where somebody isn't breathing, but they're already like, it's an old person who's already gone. Like they've already passed, but we don't know that. And all you have is somebody who's not breathing. So you're running lights and sirens. But when you get there, it's, just it's over like the situation's already done it's not interest like it, i mean it's interesting it's important but it's not exciting sure uh, when you see cops doing that you're expecting all right there's an armed robbery you know or they're about to go into something crazy and it's going to make the news and it just does it yeah and yeah. like even when i got out i see him going by and that kind of came right back into my brain like, oh they must be going to something exciting so like i text my buddies like hey man i just saw a bunch of cops going this way what's going on <laughs> like you just want to know and uh -huh. most of the time it's just not interesting <laughs> and, sure and that just kind of sucked when you're in it yeah well i guess maybe that makes it easier on the outside because you know that you know maybe a majority isn't you're not missing out maybe i don't i don't know how you feel about that maybe we can get into that but i, I am curious of your transition out of law enforcement you know so what drew you out of that sector and and for the change there's a lot that goes into that, honestly. Um, I think the short answer was I was a little bit burnt out being in a smaller department like I was. There were some frustrations there with like minimal resources, uh -huh. not having as many people on at the same time as I wanted necessarily. Sometimes your backup's a little far away, and that got to me a little bit. Any government job, the pay generally isn't super great. For that, putting your life on the line every day, not getting paid appropriately is wild. I, I encourage everyone to look up what cops are paid it's a lot less than you would expect oh yeah and the majority of jurisdictions and states all that kind of added up and i had been in title insurance throughout college and things like that so i had a general familiarity with the real estate market my team the ham team uh rick is my dad so <laughs> that was a part of it is he got me out of it and zach is just awesome and so it, we kind of all talked and we had really bonded over it and we're like hey you want to join the team it makes a lot of sense and we think you're looking for something different i said sounds good and so i was able to transition out and universe we bought together and the idea of or i guess founded together the idea of having your own business and that kind of a thing was really appealing to you know 30 year old me and sure. so 
we kind of decided to do that route. And there are days I miss law enforcement for sure. Uh, the excitement factor of going to those super serious calls and lights and sirens is called code three. It goes back to the 10 code days of old, really like 10 3, 10 4. Like everyone knows 10 4. I don't know. Like 10, 10 4, 3 good buddy. is lights and. Yeah. Letter Kenny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Such I a love good Letter show. Kenny. Oh, man. But yeah, so 10 3 was lights and sirens. So you hear guys talk about going code three or running code. That's just lights and sirens. But that is seriously the most fun I've ever had. Like, Who's? in the <laughs> academy, even, like, I'm a generally level headed, don't show a lot of emotion kind of person. And in the academy, I was trying to take it super seriously. Like, I'm, this is very serious. It's an important thing. And I just was very neutral the entire time. And then we got into the cars and we're doing driving on this private track. And you're going like, they encourage you to go balls to the wall, floor it, lights and sirens are going off. You're doing high speed lane changes. Like you're making the car spin out. <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me, we kind of became friends throughout the academy. And he goes, I have never seen you smile. Like you were the first time you got behind that, like ear to ear. I was grinning away. This is so freaking fun. Like <laughs> part of it's the exhilaration of just doing that. And part of it's just like, it is dangerous. Like. There is an inherent danger, even on the training track, that you could flip it. Sure. And I got up on two wheels a couple of times. Like, oh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> sure. I mean, why do people jump out of planes and skydive? You know, exactly. It's, like, it's so dangerous, but the, the flip exhilaration side of that. factor is just amazing. And yeah. yeah, when you're sitting behind a desk for, you know, the fourth or fifth day, it's Thursday or Friday that week, you know, like, well, I, I wish I could go drive really fast down the road right now. Yeah. It's just one of those things. And, I definitely miss it some days. Yeah, I was wondering about that. I, have you found yourself uh, now as a civilian? That's what I call you, right? Yeah. Have you had to utilize your training, you know, like, oh, I went past a a situation and as a citizen, I felt obligated to like intervene as has something come up? Not to intervene. Generally, you don't want to just let yeah. Let the cops do their thing. If you want to intervene, be a good witness and call. Like that's right. really the best answer and civilian wise. I don't know what's going on. And so I'd rather just stay out of it. But if you want to watch and, you know, be a witness, go for it. But the the cop in you never goes away. And so like I've gotten a little bit better. But when I first got out, like I'd sit in my desk and my desk had my back to the door. And I was so uncomfortable for like four or five months. Like, every time somebody would come in, I would have to turn around and stare at them. Otherwise, it was just weird. Like, oh, sir. I was freaking out about it. And, like, you go sit in a restaurant, you don't want your back to the door. You want to see who's coming in and out. And things like that don't ever really go away. I've kind of forced myself a little bit out of it just because I wanted to, I guess, get back to a little bit of normalcy. But you still play the what-if game. Like, all right, this is what's going on here. Or like, somebody robbed that gas station while you're sitting at a light. Like, all right, I might come up from there. I might park here. Like, there's my line of sight. They're going to run this direction. Like, you're trying to figure out your north, south, east, and west. And you you never stop really playing that game. And you watch news stories or you watch crime shows even now. And it's like, that's so unrealistic. Or they messed up here. Or, like... I'm still infatuated with true crime. Like I watch oh, I bet. all the podcasts, any documentary I can find, like and you just kinda watch it and sometimes you get frustrated by like law enforcement incompetence. Sometimes you just appreciate the skill of the criminal. Like D B Cooper is amazing to me. Like how that dude still got away. Um <laughs> and some of them are just like really cultural events, like cultural crimes. I mean, because I'm from Colorado, we had Columbine, we had you know, the Batman shooting, that was in Aurora. Uh -huh. You had uh, John Bonet Ramsey was in Colorado. And these are all like national major crime. Like they are cultural changing events. Mm -hmm. And you grow up around that and it just becomes a part of you. And you kind of, I, I guess I became more infatuated with it than some other people might. But the idea of those things happening is so crazy to me. When you, a normal day now is you wake up and you go, like I said, you drive to work, you do your thing and you drive back home. But to think that that could happen down the street. I mean, here in Florida, we had the Orlando shooting, Pulse, right. all that kind of stuff. And so yeah. it happens everywhere. But yeah. you distance yourself from it and think it can't happen to me when, I mean, it really can. It would be crippling if, and and I think some people probably are crippled by it. But if we were always thinking about it, and it's it's certainly more top of mind as far as like school shootings now, like having a daughter now, I'm like, man, like homeschooling kind of sounds okay because at least I know she's more safe but it's like 
at a certain point, you you have to put it out of your head and not focus on that because most times you go to a movie or go to school, you're going to be okay. It's these terrible people who ruin it for everybody. Just like, you know, 9-11 changed the game for airport security. And now we have to go way earlier. And in a way, I'm glad to be safe. But at the same time, it's like, what a bummer. It is. I mean, we could just keep going down these routes because I'm, I'm kind of curious from your perspective. I do got a couple of things on that. If you want me to interject really quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so both my capstone projects for my undergrad and my uh, master's degree were on mass shootings. And so what we did is we polled students from different universities about like how mass shootings have impacted their day-to-day behavior. Like, does it prevent you from going to class? Have you missed a class because of it? Have you changed your path of how you get to school? Or do you make sure you're with people all the time? Like, do you have a bulletproof backpack? Because that came out in between when I did my bachelor's and master's, like all these different things. Like, do you avoid large gatherings? And so I did my bachelor's in 2013, and by and large, it was pretty, no, I don't care, was more or less the response. Like, yeah, that happens. It's worrying, but I'm going to continue to live my life. It won't be me. By 2020, when I did my master's stuff, it was a lot different. There were a lot more people that are, you know, I am avoiding going to large gatherings. I do avoid, you know, going through campus at night alone. I avoid going to sporting events or whatever it may be, they the response was so much more, not necessarily afraid of it, but very much more conscious of that is something I consider. I want to be around people I know and things like that. And the defense, self-defense kind of stuff picked up as well. I'd be interested to see what that kind of a survey would get today, a few years later even, just because it hasn't slowed down, the violence continues to happen. And you mentioned like changing security at airports. One thing that did happen is we had the town parade. And so they had floats and stuff going down. And um, obviously we're going to be around for security for an event and they're going through town and their floats and there's people all around on the sides, you know, watching them, catching their candy. and like like a parade. One of the floats that nobody told us about was for a laser tag company. Oh, And so the people on the laser tag thing have realistic looking rifles and they are pointing them at the crowd Oh, with their laser tag logo on the side of their thing. And we didn't know that. And so I'm walking down, just kind of like watching the crowd, watching the floats go by or whatever. And I see that. (laughs) And I instantly had my hand on my gun. I was ready to go. Like I'm about to have to like shoot people in the middle of... A parade. Of a parade. <laughs> and I think it was even the high school parade. Like, they had high schoolers and stuff everywhere. And Oh, my gosh. Like, luckily, there was a moment where I'm like, this can't be real. Like, yeah, it crossed my mind and, like, and splash of a second because nobody else was freaking out running away. So I'm like, there's something here. And, like, I looked and I read the side of the thing and said that. And I was like, all right. But afterwards, I got, like, our chief and another officer. And, like, we went and pulled them over. And we're like, who did you not tell that this is happening? Like, this isn't okay. Like doing? there was no orange tips on them. I was there wondering. Was no indication that these were fake guns at all. They looked like actual assault rifles. They were pointing them at the crowd, and I was angry. Like it was scary in the moment, just because it could have been. But it's because of all these experiences. It's because these things keep happening that you have to prepare for that, and you have to treat it as real until it's not. And I was luckily, I guess, that I was calm enough to take the second to think. Otherwise, even if I had drawn down on them, whether I shot or not, I'm national news at this point. (laughs) Yeah, even if you don't shoot. Even if you don't. They're going to be like, a cop pointed a gun at a guy during a parade, and all they were doing was shooting laser guns. And now you're like, every political pundit's going to have an opinion on guns. And And you're like, but if they had real guns, I would have saved your asses. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And it's such a stressful thing to be under in that moment. And- the average ley line person, like, they didn't know they were doing anything wrong. They they have a laser gun business. They're trying to, you know, show laser tag or whatever, and they're not thinking a cop might shoot me. And they're not thinking about cops thinking their guns are real. They're not worried about what the public perceives that as being. And so it's so hard, I think, to really have that conversation and to explain the differences because you don't want to overgo one way with it and make it so people can't have fun. Like, I grew up with paintball guns, airsofts. Like, oh, yeah. I love doing that kind of stuff. I don't want to take that away. Well, I was going to ask, I was wondering, because it got me thinking, you know, from your perspective with like 
the popularity of like fake guns, Nerf guns, paintball guns, airsoft rifles, games, you know, all the first person shooters, the true crime podcasts, the show Cops. Do you feel like these things help? Like, okay, there are paintball guns out there, so maybe people are less likely to buy real guns and do real violence because they can get it out. Or same with like a video game. Or do you think that exacerbates the, you know, the problems? What do you? Right. Do you I'll try not to get too political. Um, I'm pretty pro gun control <laughs> in general. Um, I don't think video games have a real correlation to real life at all. Uh -huh. I think science has overwhelmingly proven that they just aren't related. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you play video games, great. You're playing video games. It has nothing to do with what you're going to do in real life. The toy gun thing is pretty concerning just because, like, you get information updates all the time in law enforcement. Like, they're in your mailbox every day. Go and open up your email and see things. People were turning, like, real guns to look like Nerf guns. Like, they would say Nerf on the side of them. They'd be pink and purple and blue and orange, like all colors that look like toys. I can paint but, an orange tip on a real gun. Yeah, and they shoot just like real, I mean, they'll kill people. But if you don't know that that exists or you're not treating it that way, they're going to have an edge. They could do harm with these fake looking guns. And it now we have ghost guns and now you have um, like 3D printed guns. I mean, you have all these different things you can get your hand on. And technology is so far ahead of legislation on this yep. and policy and it, it is concerning, and it is something you have to worry about. I think, ultimately, the solution is gun control. Whether or not that happens, I don't know. I think America as a whole, like you said, there's so many of these events that are happening. We're desensitized to violence. I mean, one of my favorite shows, I think in one of our first meetings, I told you Game of Thrones. It's a very violent show. There's a lot of blood and gore in that show. But it did, one, it didn't bother me. But how much of that is because I'm desensitized to it sure. from real life? How much is because you see it all the time on TV? How much of that is real life things? I mean, so much now, even on the news, they're showing like bodies under sheets to that extent. Like you can see blood on the news now or Google crime scene photos, pick your favorite crime and look up crime scene photos. I mean, you can see terrible things. And when you get to that level that, at least with me, it's very interesting or somebody's intrigued by it. Now it loses its value in terms of a deterrent. Like you're just not afraid of the violence. You're not afraid of the gore. It's it's not going to move the needle on policy either because people just don't care. And I think ultimately what kind of drew me over the line with gun control was Newtown. When you have all the kids that are elementary school and you went in there, I think you killed like 23 kids or something like that. Like, and we did nothing. I don't get it. And once you do nothing for that, I don't know what it would take for anything to happen. I don't know if there can be an event that's strong enough for that to happen. I don't understand how that hasn't, the many instances haven't. Maybe it's because the people who are ultimately making the collective decisions, because it's not like one person. I mean, if... If they could just put it in their minds, if that was your child in that school, just put yourself in those shoes. Now, how would you react to legislating? I feel like it'd be different, but oh, now it's one of my kids, not my problem. But it could be, and it was someone's. It's like, how is that shrugged off in any way? How is that appropriate, responsible, humane? <laughs> it boils my uh, blood. <laughs> and... So, like I said, my other master's was in public administration, and we learned a lot about election cycles, and we learned a lot about public leadership and those kinds of things. And now looking at all these issues, it's like you think through the filter of, okay, how is that going to impact my voters? How is it going to impact me getting to keep my job? How is it going to impact these things? Who cares? And if Just you're in, make the right decision. Come on. That is my opinion. <laughs> I share that with you. But so many of these folks are, you're in... It just happens to be a red side. If you're on the red side of this issue, the answer is not going to be gun control. And if you're in a red district, which I, I'm from Grand Junction, Mesa County is where Bobert is. Oh. So it is a red area. Uh -huh. And if that's the public that you're serving and those are your constituents, you are not going to ever endorse it because you'll lose that ability. Like you will lose your job. And it's that one hot button issue that everybody doesn't seem to want to touch. And it's... The one of the most important, if not the most important, that we have right now. And it's like if no one touches it, then nothing happens. So, like, someone's got to break it. And obviously there are people out there speaking against it, but 
needs to be overwhelming. And it's so surprising that it's not overwhelming, especially like, okay, we've had a few mass shootings, school shootings, school shootings in particular. It's like, all right, let's step back. Let's all breathe and work through this methodically and practically. And two things on that too is like, there's a website that tracks all the mass shootings. I can't remember what it is. I think it's any more than three people that get shot. They count as a mass shooting, maybe yeah. four. Right, um, something like that. There's so many hundreds of them we don't hear about. Uh -huh. And if right. you follow online discourse of mass shootings or you talk to people about mass shootings or true crime, like that you're just in that community that are interested in it, you have to like specify which one. Like we all know Columbine, we all know Batman, we all know Newtown, but like there's so many now, like even if you follow them, you don't remember. That's like, a problem. Oh, yeah, I had to remember that one or whatever it is. And that's insane. And then you look at other countries that, don't have that issue like oh we're off the charts it is a uniquely american problem yeah the one time it happened in australia they immediately passed gun legislation and they haven't had a single one since yep like it, uh, it is frustrating and from the law enforcement like as a human side that's kind of one thing but like from the law enforcement side you don't want to be in a position where that's a thought like we had a swatting incident at the high school uh, when I yeah. was in law enforcement. So. You want to explain what swatting is for anybody who doesn't know? Yeah, so swatting, um, somebody calls in like a fake crime or a bomb threat. So they can call dispatch and say, hey, there's a bomb at you know this address or whatever. There's a bunch of people in here shooting or whatever it is. The goal is to get police to go in there with guns blazing and shoot somebody or harm somebody or right. to get cops to make a mistake because they think they're responding to something super important. Which is so not cool. Um what this dude, I think they ultimately caught him too. He was out of like Kentucky or something and he'd been calling a bunch of schools. But he called one of the local high schools and said, you know, hey, we got bombs and everything in there. and Like somebody's going to come in there and shoot up the school. Don't like leave or whatever. So everybody from the school is freaking out and calling in. And then now all these agencies are flooding this high school and they have to go sweep the school now with bomb dogs because there's threats of that. So they're trying to bust all these kids out and you can't just let the kids run wild out of the school because that's going to create more problems and so you're trying to control all these kids contain the situation deal with the potential that this isn't a threat like they had to check kids backpacks for guns because we don't know who called it in and so much was going into that and they bust them all the palisade to be picked up and so we're out there trying to navigate another 600 kids coming in on these buses to get them to their parents who are all pissed off because they don't know where their kids are at and they're worried something bad's happening and it's like, I mean, we're trying to get them to you as quickly as we can, but there's a lot that goes into this. And so something so small as the swatting call is so effective because of the paranoia that that can be happening. Yeah. And because that is such a realistic part of our society. And when you get the swatting call from law enforcement, you have to take it seriously until it's not. 100%. Yeah. Because if the one time you don't will be the time it is. Yep. And your liability on both ends, it, if you do or don't, sucks. <laughs> like, all you can do is hope you respond in like it's real and hope for the best. But be conscious that if you show up and, it, like, it's not matching what you're being told. Like, someone's like, there's an active shooter in the high school. And you show up and you're not hearing gunshots. You're not seeing kids down. People are walking around like everything's normal. Odds are it's a SWAT. Like, it's not a real call. And you have to be conscious of that. At the same time, being like, hey, this is what's called in. Like, lock down the school, for one. Let's figure out what's happening. And like, you have to play through all these steps. And it's yeah. a very difficult and complicated position to be in. Incredibly. It's just uh, unfortunate parts of our society. And I, I, I certainly hope it gets better for me. The, the solution is just more education and more access to resources for people to be brought up in better environments and living situations so that they're not having issues that lead to someone making a choice to do something like that, whatever the crime may be. It's wild. And I don't know how you remove violence from the American culture. I mean, it's been there since day one. I mean, like, yeah. it is literally in Ingrained. our blood at this point. I don't know how you start to pull that out and the entertainment value of it. I mean, everybody's favorite movie or favorite show at some point is going to have some level of violence in it. I mean, that's just the way it goes. And some things the schools are doing now, like they have uh, like the vestibules, secure vestibules. When you go in, you can't actually get into the school and they have the bullet resistant class. Like those are all good things. Kind of sucks. It but... sucks that you're, I mean, you're putting your kid in a prison to go to school essentially. Yeah. 
and they only allow like entrance through one door but the reality is if someone wants to do harm you prop open a door you break open a door like you can defeat virtually all safety mechanisms if you're that committed to it yeah or if you're really doing it you'll find some town that hasn't made those changes and it's still game on uh-huh. and there's so many different schools in the country that you can't do that with every single one and it's just such a <laughs> difficult problem to have but the only way you're ever going to solve it is by talking about it and working through it and finding the technology and accepting the reality of these things happening yeah and i don't know what law enforcement's role in that would be necessarily other than to give their stories like mine or yep. have somebody else it's like hey this actually did happen this would have been helpful or if we had this it would have been great and try to use that to our advantage of what's happened instead of just saying oh that's an exception not the rule yeah i mean it's pretty clear those situations are the rule now yeah well i mean it's one one reason of many that i am passionate about this podcast is because as we move forward we're going to have more and more important conversations like this all the conversations we had are important i feel like this one's up there in a different category you know, um, where these are important conversations and that's ultimately going to th- be the thing that hopefully changes minds and gets people thinking more clearly or, you know, gives them perspective to to make change. Everything's been pretty heavy up <laughs> until this point and, and it's been fantastic. We have this section called the rapid fire. Pew, pew. And uh I'm just going to ask you a few questions that I ask all guests. Uh, it's just a very interesting part of the uh, podcast. So are you ready? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. All right. Of course, he's going to keep his composure <laughs> on this one. All right. What is your biggest source of inspiration? Honestly, I don't know if I have a specific source. Um, I draw a lot from athletes. Um, so I am a huge sports fan. I love the NFL. I love the NHL. So like Paul Correa was a hockey player. Undersized dude an Asian guy in the NHL, so out of place, but he dominated. And growing up, I just loved watching him play because I I am a smaller individual. Like, I'm not, like, huge at all. And so playing sports like that, that was really inspirational. Or, you know, hearing the stories of the guys that come from nothing or have so many problems, but they are able to overcome all these different things and make it big in the pros and make those millions of dollars and um, really become leaders. And so I definitely think there's a lot of athletes um, for law enforcement, as crazy as it sounds, Jack Bauer is still still up there, man. Oh, I mean, sure. He still has a lot on my mind and just the risks he was willing to take and the morals and principles that come out of that. And, I mean, of course, everybody loves their parents, right? And so you kind of rely on those as leaders and let them set the example for you. So I definitely look up to them. Nice. Yeah. Just because it's fiction, like you're thinking about Jack Bauer, doesn't mean that you can't draw inspiration from that. Um, so that's a great point. Do you have a favorite book? So covered this at the first Sun Leaders meeting. I don't like to read at all. <laughs> I haven't really read for fun since probably middle school. So I don't really have a favorite book. The favorite book that's been turned into a TV show is Game of Thrones. Okay. But I also kind of cool. dig the Harry Potter series and stuff too. Oh, you can't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Those books are great. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, how about a favorite musical artist or an album? Uh, Linkin Park. And probably Meteora was my favorite album. Great album. I'm pretty sure I listened to a song from that uh, earlier today. It's everyone loves their first album, Hybrid Theory. It's I think it's ranked as like the 36th best selling album of all time or something like that. I think Meteora is so much better. (laughs) It's great. Yeah, Linkin Park just bangs. They're great. That would be my favorite. Second would probably be Eminem and Marshall Mathers LP. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a great one. Classic. Yeah. So good. So intense. So he, he, is, he rocks, and he has a way with words. There's one song called The Ringer. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that. My goodness. So intense. He's but... a lyrical genius, man. Oh, yeah. he, he's <laughs> able to convey some pretty... Crazy concepts and inspiration through music. I guess the yeah. source of inspiration would be him, just certainly fingers to the world and being himself. I mean, that's the way to do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, last one. How do you define success? Like all answers with law enforcement, it depends. Uh, it depends on what you're measuring it with. I mean, if it's business, most common answer is financial success. You're 
bank account grows, law enforcement success is just everybody's safe at the end of the day. The case was solved. The people are happy. You know, I mean, it's it just depends on what you're dealing with. I think for me in particular, what defines success is happiness. And I kind of correlate the two. I think if you're able to achieve, like you love waking up in the morning and you're happy with your job and you have people in your life that bring you joy, you've achieved so much in life simply by having those kinds of things. And if you're happy when you wake up, I do think that is a success. Couldn't agree more. And uh, most guests, that is a common thread between them is happiness. So um, Jordan here, when he was on the podcast, that was his answer. So yeah, you win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, to, just to wrap it up, um, really quick, specific to you, what's a quick big tip or hack that people can utilize when interacting with the police that they might not be aware of. I mean, there's the common ones, right? Don't ever put your hands in your pockets. Make sure they can see what's going on with you. That's practical. That's a practical one. <laughs> Honestly, the best answer I can give is if you think you're a suspect, say nothing. Give them your ID and shut up. <laughs> like cops have very limited leeway honestly in the american judicial system with what they can and can't do our rights are pretty extensive until you are in the system and so don't say anything that's where you build your crime is you're going to say something dumb and i'm going to catch on to it and that's cops are master communicators i mean that's what makes you good at that job is you're able to talk to people get them talking to you and they'll get them liking you and if they like you enough they're just going to be like oh this guy's chill hey man i kind of did that and like you solve the case that way. Right. Don't be hesitant with your ID because that'll get you in cuffs or harmed. But hand out your ID willingly and shut up would be my advice. All right. <laughs> Good deal. I wanted it to be practical at the end here. Uh, future goals. What does uh, five, 10 years look like for you and Unifirst? I would love for Unifirst just to expand. I don't know what that exactly is. I haven't set a benchmark for that. Um, I do hopefully want to have an office here in Florida because we only have our uh, single headquarter location in Grand Junction. So having a branch office here would be huge for me. And just having the ability to have a wide network and reliability for a sources of business and being able to just be intertwined with that community and the ability to just take care of anybody's needs. Like I have a guy for this, I have a guy for that. And knowing that when your clients come to Universe or I, your clients, my clients come to yeah. Universe, you know, we have the ability to take care of their entire needs throughout the home buying process. Sure. And so having all of that layered out would be huge for me. And I would be proud as a business owner to be able to have that. Sounds like you'll get there. And uh, we'll have the link to your website in the show notes here that people can get in touch with you and uh, learn more about your business. Last question I ask everybody, your biggest piece of advice for anybody listening in any, any way, some advice that you feel like was really important to you or that you would have wanted to hear you know when you were younger so we've got two one like the it start it's a campaign now but it's so valuable is the dude be nice just be nice to people it goes so far in bringing you joy and happiness in your life because you feel better because you don't have that negativity around you but you make better connections you make more friends people like you more and it opens so many doors even if like you don't like that person or disagree with them like just be nice. Like if you're respectful, it gets you so much credibility. And the other one is honestly just be you. Like it's okay if people don't like you or they don't see the world the way you do. Just be tolerant that people can disagree with you and people are going to be different, but embrace who you are, whether that's internally, whether that's something that you view as gender or sexuality, or there's so many social issues now that go around that. Just be who you are. You will find people that love you for who you are and that agree with that and want you to succeed in life. And you can't find those people if you're afraid to be who you are. I love both those points. That's such a high note to end on this. Uh, I will say this is one of the fastest interviews. Like the time I looked at my phone here, I can't believe how quickly this one went. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you again for like coming in and sharing your experiences and also thank you for your service and like being brave and what what you've done that's enormous and i you know i don't get to interact with many people in positions such as yours that you were in and 
So I just wanted to extend thanks, and I'm sure people listening also are thankful for people like you. I appreciate that, and thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks a lot.